startuprad.io, your podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hello and welcome, everybody. This is Joe from StartupRadio.io, your startup podcast and YouTube blog from Germany, as well as the world's first internet radio station dedicated to startups and tech companies. Today, it would not surprise you have another interview guest here, but this time uh, the interview guest is special. Not only does he run a fintech with more than 80% women as clients, uh, but they are also from Austria. Therefore, I would like to welcome Martin. Hey, how are you doing? Hi, Joe. Thanks for having me. It's a total pleasure to have you here. And as people can already see who are watching this on YouTube, you already have your monkey sign here. So for everybody who's listening to the audio podcast, that's a monkey, M-O-N-K-E-E -E, with a double E. And I really love your URL, monkey rocks. <laughs> Re really cool stuff. And we will totally get into what you guys making, uh, differently, what you're doing different. Uh, but first let's talk a little bit about you because I realized you are an engineer by training. And I found it totally fascinating that you attended two universities in China, Beida, uh, the Peking University, Beijing University, uh, one of the, usually it's, it's, uh, said to be the Harvard of China and Fudan Dashio, uh, Fudan University. And you did a lot of courses, executive education, and you're working on a PhD in savings behavior. Can you take us through this journey and what do you learned there? Yeah, sure. So by, as you mentioned, by background, I'm a mechanical engineer. And uh, after after that, I started working at a company called Swarovski. It's an Austrian-based jewelry company. And uh, because for me, it was always clear that um, after kind of doing this mechanical engineer, I need to earn some money. And while, while working there, I realized that I would really love to dig a little bit, little bit more deeper into the topics of um, business administration and marketing. And then I started uh, studying two university degrees parallel to my job. Uh, was a very busy time studying in lunchtime, in the evenings, on the weekends. And uh, during my work at Swarovski, uh, I was traveling quite a lot to, to Asia and in particular China. And I really love China and the Chinese culture, Chinese food. And this is where I decided that I also would like to do kind of an executive education course for three or four months in China, where I had the chance to study at the Beida and the Fudan University. Um, uh, you love China. What's your favorite dish? <laughs> <laughs> there's so many because there's not this chi Chinese food like we know it here. There's so many different cuisines there. Um, yeah. So, but I love baking duck, which is something you would never get here in Austria. <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. Um, the roast duck. Yeah. Um, I like and the hot really and those dumplings. Um, yeah, the dumplings. Yeah, oh, the mm, mm, chiaozi, baozi, mm. yeah, and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. the hot and sour <laughs> soup you get in Beijing. I also like that. I even got used to it for breakfast uh, when I was living there. Really, really oh, cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, we may for all. Uh, let's say for the men not in a committed relationship yet, we may tell them what Swarovski is. Everybody who has a girlfriend already knows. Um, here in Germany, and I do believe all over Europe, you found, you find them in the city centers. Basically, uh, they are making uh, jewelry out of a very special, very glitzy glass crystals something like that you, you 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 can totally correct me there and um they, they make very nice um jewelry and um most of the women love this but guys to be sure ask them before i i, I had the personal experience that it, it it can really split uh women between they love them and they hate them so um so if, if, you, if you don't like sparkle, then Swarovski is the brand for you. <laughs> yes, and if, if she loves sparkle or if you love sparkling, you're all set. 
No, no problem at all. And what did you do there? And what did you learn there? Because I realized you've spent there more than a decade, like 16 years at Swarovski. What did you do there? And what did you learn there? I mean, I, I had the chance to every two to three years do something different there. So I entered the company as being a project manager within the product development area. So I was developing jewelry and other products. And uh, after then, I finished my my university degree at business administration. I switched to the marketing side of the business, where after some reorganizations, I had the chance to to lead a very large product group as director product management, being responsible for the overall product group. And after the next reorganization, I had the chance to lead the, the global trade marketing organization, so being responsible for B2B marketing, basically. And my last career step at Swarovski was being responsible for the global innovation management department. And there I had the chance to, beside the more, let's say, traditional type of innovation projects, to also work for a lot of explorative projects for, in particular, one of these Swarovski family members. And uh, it was all, a lot about digital, new digital business models in the area of activity tracking, uh, emotions tracking. So how could we use the real estate on the body of the consumer in order to build new business models, basically? And this is where I also dig quite deep into the topic of gamification, behavioral design, and how to use data in order to help people improve their habits. And um, yeah, read a lot about nudging, had the chance to talk with a lot of very interesting people in this area. And as I also, I was always very passionate about the topic of finance. So since I'm very young, I am very actively trading. So with Monkey, I'm basically combining my passion for finance and what I learned in the area of um, habit forming technology, so to say, and started building together with my friend. Monkey, which is at the end a product that should help people improve their financial habits and save more money for what's really important to them. You've been talking about nudging here, and we may add for everybody who's not familiar with the term, basically it's when you have a consumer and he's about to make a decision or somebody who's about to make a right decision in terms of like a uh, healthy, uh, healthy food or stuff like this, you just nudge them a tiny bit in the right direction. So basically you're not trying to completely influence this, but you try to nudge them in the right direction. So it's basically nothing. They totally don't want to do it. It's like they're very close to your decision and they just need one, one more tip into into the right direction. Is this approximately right? Yeah, so nudges are basically soft pushes uh, into bringing people into the right habits where the people always have the chance to do differently. So it's not kind of manipulating. It's not giving them no other chances. And usually nudging is used a lot in the areas of health, wealth, and happiness. So those are kind of the three big areas where in the United States, um, there are already a lot of cases of where nudging, nudging is very yeah, successfully uh, implemented and just taking activity trackers, for example. So if you have this daily target of walking 10,000 steps and you're receiving a push notification, hey, Joe, today you just walked 9,000 steps, that's already a nudge because that shows you that you are a little bit behind target. You can decide to stay on your couch and watch the next Netflix episode, but you might say, okay, I want to reach these targets, stand up and walk for another thousand steps. So that's already a nudge, for example. And we're using that a lot within our app as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We, we're already talking about the app. I, I just missing one piece here. Um, when did you decide after 16 years at Swarovski, when and why did you decide to leave and how did you get started with the idea of monkey? Yeah, I mean, since I'm very young, I'm always a very restless person. So there's hardly an evening where I'm sitting on the couch doing nothing. So I always had projects beside my corporate job at Swarovski. Um, but then I think it, it started... And, and I always planned to do something myself, work on my own project, but I never really had this one idea where I said, okay, uh, I'm, I'm quitting a really 
a job that I like, which is which has a good salary. Uh, I mean, I'm married, I'm having a kid, which makes it, makes it not easier to quit your job, right? Uh, but then in 2017, 16, um, I was able to quite successfully build my own rainy day fund with, <laughs> you, you sometimes call it fuck you money. So a pot of money, which gives you the space to say, the room to say, okay, I'm doing something differently. And then... I mean, I mentioned already that within the corporate world, there was every two to three years a re large reorganization within the within the company. And after many reorganizations, at one point, I decided that I don't want to be at the front for the next reorganization. And so on the one hand side, I was building up my pot of money, which gave me enough room to also, let's say, promise to my wife and my kid that um, I'm not going all in, but I'm we have the room to work on our own project and there is still some money left. And if everything goes wrong, which gives us enough space to work on plan B. And on the other hand side, I, I was a little bit, let's say, exhausted with regards to running the next reorganization. And I started having more and more conversations with my, with my friend who was also at this time working at Swarovski, but in Switzerland. And, um, and we were talking more and more about different ideas and at one point we said, okay, besides a job which consumes us for more than 100%, we're never going to be able to work really on a new thing. And we just decided to quit our jobs. We had three different ideas. We gave ourselves three months to go in all three different ideas a little bit more in detail. And then we decided to go to Berlin for two weeks, uh, go into different startup hubs, get a little bit, let's say, um, inspired by what's happening there. And our plan was that at the end of those two weeks, we're deciding for which of the three ideas we're going kind of to run. And at the end, we decided on day number one already that what's today called monkey, that this is going to be the idea and started prepare ourselves within those two weeks in Berlin. And this was beginning of 2018. And since then, we're working full time on monkey. I would be curious. Um, what was the point that nudged you and your co-founder towards Monkey? And the second one, of course, would have been the other business ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it have been three completely different ideas. I mean, it was, I mean, end of 2017, it was the really hot time with regards to blockchain. So there has been one idea in the blockchain area, one idea more in the food delivery area. Um, and then this idea, kind of this fintech idea, and as already mentioned, we are both always have been very passionate about finance. We have been looking a lot to the United States, what's going on there with regards to finance. And we saw that there is this emerging financial well-being, financial health trend, which in the United States already created huge organizations, huge startups with millions of customers. And we realized that Europe... It, like with many things, it's a few years behind and there was this PSD2 on the horizon and we realized that as soon as PSD2 really hits the ground, um, there might be kind of this, this might be a really hot topic within the startup world and we might have a window of opportunity to start working now on Monkey to until PSD2 is really there and banks have to implement that, we are set up and can leverage those new opportunities. And um, during the time in, in Berlin and also before we had the chance to, to talk to a few friends in the startup world, talk to a few people we know in the venture capital area, reflected a little bit on those three ideas. And at the end, I mean, we liked the idea. We thought it's really something that could potentially deliver a part of a solution for a large social challenge. And uh, I mean, after 15 years in the corporate world, after building up your own kind of rainy day fund, we really wanted to do something that has an impact and not just anything. And those have been reasons why at the end we decided to go for what's called monkey today. I would be curious because uh, monkey is a savings app and you talk a lot about raising a, or a saving for a rainy day fund. Um, was there like a connection? Do you also offer tools or reward behaviors um, of your clients that 
you did as well in building up your rainy day fund? Yes. I mean, so with, with Monkey, we have the vision to help millions of people improve their financial well-being. Because why financial well-being? Uh, because we know that and studies show that very clearly that money worries are already the number one factor for stress. Money worries are negatively impacting um, physical health, mental health, relationships, work performance. So money worries, they're really a thing. And when looking into what's really stressing people, it is not how much money they are going to have when they are retiring. It's the money for the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, and there we are really talking about rainy day fund. We're talking about expenses that might come up over the next 12 to 18 months. It, we're talking about what's going to happen if my kid comes into school and needs a laptop. And um, this is why we decided that in the first step, Monkey is really going to be about helping them saving money for the short to midterm. Uh, kind of uh, perspective and then only in the next step kind of adding new products which might help to then also improve financial health for the longer term perspective but we we thought that as being a startup in the german speaking world where there is where consumers are anyhow a little bit more conservative we as a startup we first need to build up trust and before someone is going to trust us with their retirement money, uh, we need to build our trust with more shorter term, smaller saving targets. And um, what, what basically we're doing is the whole the whole is app is circled around concrete saving targets. So people go into the app, they they enter what they want to save for. Uh, Monkey already here starts nudging what other people are saving for. So it's a little bit like the Amazon people who buy this also bought that kind of approach. So by getting inspired what other people are saving for, it's not us telling you it's other people are doing this. You're also getting some, let's say, inspiration for what what make, might make sense for me to save as well. Then we are taking those longer term saving targets and breaking them down into more motivating weekly challenges. So because we as people, we humans, we tend to procrastinate. So everything that's more in the future, we just postpone that for as long as possible. And just the near future, that's more important to us. And the problem with with goals that are in the future is that we have a lot of time and possibilities to procrastinate. And this is something we learned from activity trackers, basically, that by implementing those 10,000 steps a day, they are making something that's very, very, let's say, subtle, something that's not, you can't grab that, making it very concrete to say, if you're walking 10,000 steps every day, you're more healthier. And that's why we are breaking down those long-term targets into weekly challenges, which makes numbers smaller. So instead of 600 euro for the laptop for your kid, it is eight euro per week for a certain period of time. You can then also compare those weekly targets with opportunity costs. So for what are you spending money on a daily basis? Because those eight euros, they're suddenly, I mean, when you're going into the shop, you're just spending them without thinking a lot about that. But this could, this money, those eight euros could be contributed to your longer term saving target. And, um, and then in the next step, you can kind of, you can put your saving targets on autopilot, which is basically then a standing order. You can go into the app and with just two clicks, you say, okay, I want to save now seven euros and an algorithm splits up those seven euros across your different saving targets based on a certain logic. You can enter certain saving rules. So for example, if you are a passionate Amazon buyer, you can set up a rule and say, okay, every time when I'm spending money with Amazon, I I, I uh, commit to save 10% or 5% and then that's saved automatically. And Monkey starts with digital nudges. In our case, those are push notifications. Uh, hey, Joe, what about saving 12 euros for your vacation next year? And then you just press yes. And if you press yes, the 12 euro get transferred to your savings account. And in the background, an algorithm starts learning when and how we need to send you those notifications. So more on Monday or on Saturday in the morning or evening, what type of message should we use? What should be the call to action? Should it be six euro, 12 euros? And over time, it starts learning where it has been most successful with you with regards to triggering saving impulses. And then it's kind of, Duplicating that. So this is the way of how we are, let's say, translating nudges into helping people saving more money for the future. And this is something which we realize is kind of, there's 
a lot of people and specifically female users who really love this gamified approach of savings, who are reacting a lot on those push notifications. So on average, our users are opening up the app more than four times a week which um, we consider as being really good and coming close to your online banking app. Um, yeah, and what we also learned is that a lot of our users, they're saving money for very concrete things. So there's on the one hand side, there's the rainy day fund, the Notgroschen in Germany. On the other hand side, it is the vacation, the e-bike, uh, their laptop, uh, ki kitchen equipment. And we thought about how else could we help them to better reach those targets. And... At the same time, we have always been confronted with the fact that for savings, you're not really getting interest. And we, as coming from the consumer goods industry, we learned that knowing what people are saving for, that's an asset. And we started building up uh, partners, retail partners, first in the area of the saving goal, so in the, in the travel area, in electronics products, in sports equipment products, and so on. And at one point in time, when you're saving, for example, for your vacation, we let you know that there is partners from Booking.com to Eltour. And if you're booking a vacation with one of, your, of our partners, you are getting money back into your saving wallet as a contribution to your other saving goals. And we are positioning it. It's called Future Boost. And we are positioning it as kind of a, a smart alternative to interest rates. So by smart shopping, kind of we always say smart shopping is the future of saving. So by smart shopping, you're contributing to your saving targets. And it's all started with partners in the area of the saving goals. And then just before COVID, we started also onboarding partners in a category that we call daily necessities. So products that you anyhow need and want to buy. So groceries, uh, um, pharmacy products and so on. And there we have a really nice, a couple of really nice partners there. And by buying your groceries at Rebe, for example, you're getting money that feeds your rainy day fund or that feeds your, your vacation target. Mm, I see. I see. I see. You, you, we've been already talking about, you have a lot of, um, uh, women as clients that's kind of the holy grail because usually uh when i talk to fintech entrepreneurs especially offline they admit uh, with a lot of luck we have like 10 percent, 20 percent, sometimes up to a third female clients how did you manage to get the to get really the the the, the fintech world uh turned upside down how how did you do that I mean, honestly speaking, we didn't plan it this way. So um, at, the very, at the very beginning, we had a quite broad approach uh, because we first needed to find out kind of what's, what's the type of users where our product really is sticky. And we did a lot of experiments there. And at one point, we realized that, first of all, we managed to onboard a really large number of women. And, and secondly, they are really they really stick to the products they really love using that and when it comes to the interaction with the product they're much more active engaging with the app than uh, male users so for example and, and of course that's a little bit black and white uh, i mentioned that there is this weekly challenge right um, male users they tend to go into the app on monday and save for their weekly challenge and are not opening the app for the rest of the week so they just want to have this challenge <laughs> accomplished Uh, while female users, they are interacting very often with the app. They love those nudges. They love kind of this digital high five when they saved, kind of when they respond positively to our saving call to actions and so on. And over time, we realized that kind of we, we at one point we had then suddenly 85%, 84% of our users were female users, so of our active users. And we started then to also change the way how we are communicating to target more the female users, which then at the end was kind of a more, of course, reinforcing spiral that we, we got more and more female users into the app. And I think it's, it's really about this gamified way of saving money for something where we think we, we hit more the taste of the female users than for the male users, which are more, I mean, and, and, and again, that's black or white. I mean, the male I think male, they more tend to 
experiment now with trade republic and with cryptocurrencies and so on. So they're always a little bit more, let's say, sometimes even overconfident. They don't have to read about investment. They're just doing that. So where the female users, they may be a little bit more conservative. They start now with savings, then read about investment and then go into investment products. So I think there are a few things coming together why Monkey at the end was very successful with the female users. Mm -hmm. I see, see, see. Um, and lesson learned for many of the fintechs, if you want to have more women, you have to tailor your app to them. And as you said, um, they love to interact. They love interaction and not just being there. Yeah. And, and of course, I mean, we are, we are, we are acquiring a large part of our users with content marketing. So it's materials about the topic of finance and saving money, downloadable content, checklists, and so on, which we see that kind of they are downloaded, these type of materials, they are downloaded a lot by the female users. So they want to inform themselves before they are doing something. They want to plan a little bit ahead. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, you've been talking about PSD2 in, in the beginning of the interview. Our frequent listeners and watch viewers, um, who are watching this will already know that, but, um, it's, it's a regulation by the European Union that the banks have to open up and basically your clients punch into, for example, your app their online identification, their ID, their email, their PIN code. And so basically you can get access only to their banking data. That's kind of the, 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 the goal of PSD2. Um, but what I was referring to, um, in one of our fintech reviews, Luca formerly would get Penta said once that it is the equivalent of opening the app store by Apple, which enabled uh, companies like Uber, Airbnb, and many, many others. Do you see this as well? And also an important question, do you think it's, it's already here? It's already in action. Do you think the potential is already completely understood? I mean, answering your first question, I would say re a, a, a very clear yes. So, I mean, there's hardly something that could give you a better picture about a person than seeing wh where they are getting the money from, how they are spending the money. So by, I think, having those transactional data on your bank accounts, that's really very helpful to better understand what's this, who is this person. And with PSD2, there is now, uh, let's start this way. And, and I think banks, they haven't leveraged that a lot in the past because they had their established business models was running for them for many, many years and decades. Um, and they didn't really leverage that a lot. And now suddenly the European Union forces them to open it up. And there's now a large number of organizations and startups like us who are thinking a lot about how can we use this data in order to create a win-win situation and are very creative in the way of using that and uh, maybe much more creative than the banks itself. And yes, you're right. So there's uh, there's hundreds or thousands of organizations working on different ideas on how to build cool products on top of this banking data that creates value for the customer that is at the moment not leveraged by, by the banks. And is it already there? Um, I mean, at, at the very beginning, I think banks, they had been very, let's say, pushing back a lot because, of course, they had to invest millions of euros in order to create APIs that uh, opens up banking data, of, which has been their asset. So, I mean, they were sitting on this data. It's their asset, opening that up for third parties like us. And there have been some banks who started very early to kind of understand that they can't, I mean, they, they can't just push back. There's no way around that. The European Union forces them to do that. And they had a more proactive approach to that. And there have been banks which for very long tried to just neglect that. And they start now maybe thinking about how to build their own product or how to collaborate with startups that are already leveraging that. But I would still say that there is 
still potential to better understand what, what else you could do with this data. Mm -hmm. You've been already talking about banks in your pitch deck. You're also referring to new banks, banks like Revolut and 26. Um, I was wondering, do you think your success so far would have been possible without a prior success of uh, N26, of a trade republic, of a revolute in the UK? Um, I mean, we, we see those challenger banks of kind of, they paved the way for solutions like Monkey that suddenly, I mean, a few years ago, it was unthinkable that a financial service can only exist as, as being an app without kind of physical stores where you can talk to someone. And N26 and Revolut and so on, you name them, with the amount of money that they received from the venture capital areas, they, they really prepared the mass market now for products that only exist as an app in a digital form. And um, I think the way how they were doing that opened up the mass market for solutions like us. So could we could we do it without them or wouldn't we be able to do it without them? Um, only I think if we would have had the money like they had in order to prepare the market. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So ba basically it's also something um, I had with the just published interview with Autonova. If there's a competitor, if there's somebody um, paving the way for you it's easier yeah. um yeah. I, I i was wondering um you guys earn money which way uh, with this future boost feature so we we consciously decided that the app should be free for the end users and uh, we are earning money with this future boost so whenever one of our users is buying the things that they need or that they want with one of our partners we are getting a commission and we give back a part of this commission to our users as a contribution as an alternative to interest rates and the interesting thing is that if you would take those future boosts um, in as a relation to how much money our users are saving the return is even more than 10 percent so it's it's a really good alternative to interest rates so by Smart spending your money, you're really getting, having a chance to grow your kind of savings because you anyhow need to spend the money on buying groceries, on buying certain products. And you already decided that you want to go on vacation. So this is maybe also something interesting, um, which has a lot to do with matching that we decided that we don't want to be paternalistic in a sense, telling our users that they should not save for certain products. So if one of our users decides that they want to save money for a new iPhone, of course we could tell them, uh, does it need to be such an expensive phone? Doesn't kind of, you know what I mean? But we, we don't want to be paternalistic. So if they want to save for an iPhone, um, we help them to save the money for that so that instead of buying the iPhone, kind of lending the money or buy now, pay later, kind of in a buy now, pay later approach, we just want to make sure that they have the money before they spend it. And it's not up to us to tell them that they should not be saving for this or that product. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see. Because this, would, this way we couldn't be successful. So people don't like organizations that tell them what they not should do. So mm -hmm. I see, CT. Uh, where are you guys actually right now available? Because when we've been talking, I found it interesting and I actually downloaded in parallel your app. Um, I'll try it out personally. Um, so you work in Germany, you work in Austria, Where? Uh, which other countries? So at the moment we are available in Germany and Austria. Uh, technically and legally, we could already offer it in within the whole European Union. Uh, just at the moment, we still see enough growth potential in Germany and Austria. And then just with the kind of after the next fundraising round, we plan to start now with more international expansion. Mm -hmm. Talking about fundraising round, when when is the next one due? Uh, we, we plan to close it by the end of this year. End of this year, which may or may not be um, delayed due to Corona or whatever else comes around, right? Yeah, so I mean, we, we, we have our puffers planned into the timeline, um, but the kind of the planned closing date is the end of the year. And we always know that things are taking, always taking a little bit longer as soon as you start kind of negotiating term sheets and everything. It always takes a little bit longer. So, but th that's the plan. 
Mm -hmm. Great. And everybody who'd like to learn more, they can go down here in the show notes. There will be a link not only to the Monkey website, to the download uh, options in the iTunes Store and the Google Play Store, but also to your personal LinkedIn profile so investors can directly reach out to you. Yeah, cool. For sure. Everybody who'd like to learn more, go down here in the show notes, wherever you're watching this and listening to this, there should be a link wherever you're watching this or listening to this. If you go down here in the show notes, there should be a link to our website or look on our website for the interview of Monkey and you'll find all the links. Once again, terribly sorry that they don't work on every device. We are trying as hard as we can, but if the app doesn't allow to have active links in the show notes, we're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> um, Martin, thank you very much. It was just a pleasure having you here. Best of luck and keep us up to date. Thanks, Joe. Pleasure was on my side and looking forward to talking to you soon. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. If you are a professional looking at the European startup scene, Germany is a place you cannot miss. Fortunately for you, there is StartupRad.io, the authority on German startups. This English-only podcast brings you fresh interviews each week. Most likely, you have never heard or read anything on these startups before in English, but you will in the future. Be ahead of the curve and subscribe to StartupRad.io podcast or check for the StartupRad.io internet radio station. Check your Alexa for the StartupRad.io skill as well. <laughs>